SAFM 104 to 107 nationwide. The Full Circle with Bridget Masinga, Monday to Friday, 1 to 3 p.m. It is uh, the incomparable Sam Smith coming through with uh, Fire on Fire. Uh, another offering for you on this uh, fabulous uh, Friday afternoon. What a prolific songwriter uh, and really one of those people who writes from the soul. He once had a conversation with uh, Kelly Clarkson and they were just they were going through his music um, and going through it lyric by lyric. And he got to relive back the emotions and the situations that had transpired with each lyric. Some of the things he regretted penning down, uh, but for the most part, not so much. Uh, we have got lawyer, model, activist, all things phenomenon joining me in studio. Uh, the incomparable and very talented uh, Utando Hopa is uh, joining me. How are you doing today? I'm good. And you, Bridget Dumelang Sanbonani Molweni to everybody. And thank you for having me on your show. Thank you so much for coming <laughs> through. Born and bred right here in Sibuke raised in Lanasia, but she has traversed the globe uh, with her activism and, of course, the modeling. And what I love is, I don't know if my assessment is correct, that the passion met the purpose in a beautiful way. Sure, actually, it's so funny. I was actually having this discussion with one of your crew members. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's actually, I think, the purpose kind of, that's what really drove the modeling. I wouldn't actually say it was the passion because mm. I had never thought I'd be a model. You okay. know, I studied an LLB. Yeah. I wanted to focus on the ideas of consent uh, regarding rape. Mm. So I became a prosecutor. Mm. Uh, I even specialized in the sexual offenses uh, courts. So, like, I got scouted when I was beginning my legal career. Yeah. So I wouldn't really say the passion particularly was there, but purpose is what molded me into this path. Oh, I love it. I love mm. it. Okay, so the purpose met the passion uh, in, in this marriage. <laughs> <laughs> it was the other way around. The purpose <laughs> met the passion uh, in a beautiful way. And of course, you went on to finish. You're, you're, you're qualified. Yes. Um, uh, do you practice? No, I haven't practiced since 2016. <laughs> like, yeah, no, it's actually, it's, it's interesting that people still, they say, you know, after you've practiced law, you'll always be a lawyer. Yeah. So people still say lawyer, but actually I haven't practiced since 2016. I mean, you're still a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Tando Hofer joins me in studio and uh, she is an internationally acclaimed South African model and activist and a lawyer. And we in conversation with her this afternoon, getting to know her a little bit better. Um, she's just collaborated with mega luxury brand Jean-Paul Gaultier for the Divine Campaign and we'll find out more about that but let's touch on your life's work um, you know because growing up ordinary family ordinary love ordinary everything but obviously extraordinary being <laughs> indeed so um, yeah so I mean as I said, and it's actually interesting because it's Heritage Month now, mm. I grew up with my grandmother and she, all I learned when I was young is family and learning about Basutu songs of heritage. And, you know, like even now as a mom, yeah. I pass those songs down to my child because I had that kind of rich childhood full of heritage. And then, you know, of course, I mean, for now, as a four-year-old or a five-year-old, my color had no social or political consequence mm. until you go out into this world that has all of these ideas about the, your skin color. And yeah. So, yeah, I think that kind of, that was a definite transition. It mm. really kind of molded a different consciousness when it came to my childhood upbringing. Yeah. Mm. Let me ask this. Um, and, and I have a friend, uh, you know, one of my closest friends, uh, Tobega Luana. She is an inclusive inclusivity activist mm. as well. Mm. Um, and she was born with a form of dwarfism. Mm. But also we always say ordinary family, ordinary life. Yes. Or nobody in her immediate circumstance yes. Yes. made her feel feel any different to anybody, yes, right? Yes. Um, even now in her grown years, in her social circumstance. But I often ask us, like, when did you become conscientized mm. that society was looking at you differently and approaching you differently when the entire your world, your intimate world, mm. you just tando? Mm. 
You know, it's actually very interesting because when I was about four or five, that's when I actually five or six, mm -hmm. that's when I started school. And that is when, I mean, I remember I went to class and is it okay if I just mix? Yes. Sometimes I just go into suit. To mix, <laughs> Sandra Sammy, mix, um, it's fine. You know, so I, I go into class and Wana, Wana Mung just sits next to me. Actually, we're just sitting about, I don't know, five kids in the desk. And this child says, don't sit next to her. And at this point in time, I was so excited to be at school. I couldn't even sleep. Mm. And at that time, actually, Moaga had put in this cute uh, polka dot dress. So I didn't go to school with school uniform the first day. I'm yeah. not sure what had happened. So when these kids started reacting towards me, I actually thought that it's because I'm the only one who was dressed in the polka dot dress. Yes. I didn't have any ideas, Hore, oh, it could be because of my albinism or anything like that. So the, the understanding of what my skin was, was gradual. It, was, it didn't actually happen in a day. It was gradual because there are two ideas of the skin of albinism. There's the Western idea and then mm. there's the African idea. And the Western idea goes into the idea of what is normal versus what is abnormal. You know, so my body got narrated in the form of disease. So when I also started learning what albinism was, I got introduced to it through the somewhat scientific or medicalized lens, yeah. which was corrective, which basically said, you're sick because of the color of your skin. Mm. You know, it's a very strange... It's a very strange conceptualization. But because we have a very racist history, which is a long one, yeah. albinism also is not, it's not, you know, it didn't, it didn't survive the issues of racism. So the idea of albinism in the Western sense is also quite, it's about like 400 or 500 years old. Long yeah. story. <laughs> but then in the African sense, it was, are you natural or are you supernatural? So when mm. you start hearing, what, hey, isishawa, you're a curse, you know, leswafe, all of that stuff. Are you good luck? Are you bad luck? There's, mm. there's that constant idea of are you human or are you other? Are you natural mm. or are you supernatural? Has there been some supernatural intervention? You know, so it's just, yo, that's why I get it. It's a gradual process of interaction and experience for you to fully understand what the body of albinism is, more so within the body of a black person. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. Lots of intersectionalities there at play mm. indeed. I, I think uh, this is a good time to uh, take a quick break and then we'll come back and continue our conversation. You're listening to Bridget Masinga on SAFM. You know, we are in conversation with <laughs> Tando Hooper. <laughs> and uh, we've got, uh, she's a model. She's an international uh, recognized, international sensation. She is a lawyer. She is an activist. And the list of accomplishments is as long as is my arms. She has addressed the United Nations on policy discussions for the Albinism Action Plan. Uh, she's participated in the, is it the Sister Summit in, in yeah. Paris? Yeah. Yes. You've done so much work, um, you know, and, and, and I love the fact that your, your mission now is really about bringing about substantive, real mm. change. Mm. Mm. Yes. Um, you know, I think it's actually quite interesting because my main form, how this all started, as I said, Hori, you know, yeah. um, I, I started modeling, but I wasn't really into mm. modeling. And I, I, when I started, I was scouted by Khar Johan Kutzia. Mm. And I said to him, you know what? I want to represent albinism in a positive way. That's the only way I can engage in this platform because I really underestimated and undervalued, quite frankly, mm -hmm. modeling. Because I was like, no, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way, you know. Um, but then with time, saying I want to represent albinism in a positive way, I think I started engaging a lot with the mentorship, mostly through literature, mm -hmm. of activists, whether it, it was critical race theory, which was something I learned in law school, <laughs> or feminism, or disability rights politics. And these are all identities that actually worked within who I am mm. as a black woman with albinism who is African. And so when I started like moving into the sphere, I actually changed my language and my understanding of what I do mm. because what I was actually working towards is not particularly to represent albinism in a positive way, 
but to enforce environments of equity, inclusion, representation, etc. Because albinism was not the only identity within me mm -hmm. that has had representational harm or representational oppression and discrimination, mm. etc. You know. Um so it's just it's just quite interesting how that started forming and adapting in different environments. Mm, mm. Mm. Oh, and that's the thing, you know, the, the drawing of those intersectionalities, mm. because uh, you, we, we don't think about the fact that it, it, you, when people say that, uh, you know, black women are three times injured, for instance, mm. I, I'm just looking at your life and mm. thinking the same rule of, of approach could apply there. Right. You're black, you're woman, and right. you're living with albinism. Right. 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 And in certain contexts, you're an African. Mm. When you start traveling, you understand how much that matters, you know. Um, and I'll give you a very interesting example. So, you know, when I started working and moved more towards work in the United States, mm. people would want to speak about the issues of albinism, prejudices, the multi killings, especially after 2008, mm. those skyrocketed. But whenever I was in an American or European setting, I would feel the conflict of intersection. Because as much as I want to talk about the issues of albinism and prejudice, etc., you are still in Europe or America that has a very racialized view of Africans. So it's almost yes. like, yeah, you people do voodoo vele, you people kill each other, you mm. know. And at that point, I cannot separate myself because, yes, I have albinism, but I am also an African. I carry both identities with me. Mm. So it's just, it was, and I, and I would find that I, I wouldn't know how to deal with those kinds of situations. Actually, let me say, it took time for me to learn how to deal with those kinds of situations. Yeah. Because it felt like whenever I would answer the question about the prejudices of albinism in Africa, I'm simultaneously reinforcing the prejudice against Africans, and I am an African mm. still. You know, it's not like I'm sometimes African and sometimes <laughs> I've got albinism. It's like you're, you're those things constantly, continuously. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that just on your point of intersection. <laughs> yeah, very, very interesting indeed. We are in conversation. If you are wondering who is this enlightened young lady uh, that is joining me in studio, <laughs> uh, and Dando Hopa joins me. She is a model, a lawyer, an activist, all things fabulous. Um, and uh, she really is just one of those people flying the African flag very, very high, uh, placed on BBC's top 100 inspirational women's list. Like I said the, the the list of accolades and things that she has done uh, is long as is my arm in a very short space of time and breaking boundaries in the beauty industry as well that has known to really just hold a very Eurocentric uh, colonial view of what beauty is um, and I wonder for you what was that like once you stepped off after that initial Chet Johan could see a fashion show um, you know, and I remember the buzz and the noise in South Africa. Mm. Then you get onto the international modeling scene. Mm. And, and I wonder what is that experience like? To be honest, it was and it still is wild. It's wild because you are constantly competing with the idea of the old God. So what beauty, we, we believe that the ideas of beauty are changing and they are in some ways. But at the same time, there is that instinct. Maybe it's because the beauty industry is such a highly commodified space. Mm. But there's still that instinct to make us all look the same. Mm. You know, for the purposes of commodification, to say that there is a particular beauty ideal that we need to conform to. Um, and I had to just fight for simple things like keeping my eyebrows pale. Mm. Um, so that, you know, or, or keeping my hair natural. And the thing is that it's not an issue if you dye your brows or if you put on a weave or, but I think that as people who are working to archive mm. life, just archive representation, I think it's part of our duty to create options of representation. We need to see different images. We need to see people being represented in different ways. We need to make sure that as we archive, we're creating options of life and options of being, mm. you know? Um, and, and, and I think for me, that is when you truly see an equitable framework. But if you're still trying to modify and make people contort to an idea, 
mm. where they where a variation of human diversity is not really celebrated, then you still see that the power dynamics are still very strong and they're still very much at play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And with that, though, she continues uh, to break boundaries four years ago, being the very first. Uh, uh, and I don't know if you were the first woman of yeah you were first woman of color living with albinism yes. to to feature on the cover bag yes. the cover of vogue uh portugal which is, is a big thing bagging any vogue cover yes so actually what happened actually there it was quite interesting because when vogue was happening i think they also didn't realize <laughs> they didn't realize that I was the first woman with albinism to be on a Vogue cover. Really? Yeah, I think, you know, that came kind of with time. <laughs> and then it was like, oh, and I think it actually came because when I was expressing in my post that, you know, I had a discussion with somebody to say, oh, you know, I would love to see a person with albinism, of, even, mm. even, even if it was a white person, yeah. you know, with albinism. But just to have albinism represented on the cover of Vogue. And, and that person a few years later became me. You know, uh, and then I think then everybody was like, wait, you know, and they actually I uh, double checked on their archive be to say because I knew for sure that it had not happened. Because yeah. the thing is that when you are looking for representation, you know what has not been represented. Mm. You know, if you're looking for yourself, you know, I, I was not here. I have not been here in these platforms in any shape or form. And Vogue was over 100 years old and I had found that to be a phenomenon that even with the dynamics that we have not even white people who had albinism were represented on on vogue because albinism has a certain social status mm. that we are trying to resist you know wow. um but yeah wow what a story what a life lived uh, what an impactful life lived and i think as we wrap up our conversation um let's touch on the newest uh, sort of accolade, the newest accomplishment, the the, the newest achievement. <laughs> <laughs> I love how coy, uh, you know, <laughs> the makers of the new school are. But, you know, as much as some people might go, ah, oh, you know, you, you're not saving the world or you are saving the world. You know, the work that you do is literally impacting thousands of lives of young women and children living with albinism out there. Um, it's not just a buzzword. It's not just a buzz phrase when we talk inclusivity, representation. Right, right. They are real lives. Jean-Paul Gaultier, Divine Campaign? Yes. Campaign about goddesses and femininity. Yes. Um, I, you know, I think for me, just conceptually, this was an interesting campaign because I had always felt like the feminine principle was being abandoned within us connecting to divinity, you know. Mm. Um, I think we have a lot of patriarchal cultures that have made the feminine and the goddess something that is that is unimportant within the world of divinity. Mm. So to have this kind of celebrated, even conceptually, was quite nice for me, you know. And as you said, Hori, we do important work because I used to be a prosecutor. I always say that, you know, when I was in a prosecutor, I was in the business of representation. And as a model, I'm in the business of representation. You, you know. Love it. Um, so, yeah, but it was a beautiful campaign. And yeah, it was, it's, we're moving, man. We're moving. I love it. And we love to see you move uh, to, to more conquering, uh, to watching this incredible story be told. And of course, uh, for Tando taking up her space in, in the archives of uh, societal history and by doing so, uh, ensuring that we find ourselves really just more conscientized on how we engage with each other and how we accept each other um, and that we see everybody, regardless of how we look, how we sound, where we grow up, that we are all just somebody's daughter, somebody's sister, just trying to realize our own dreams. It's such a pleasure to finally meet you face to face and thank you for taking the time thank you for having me it's a pleasure <laughs> that is it for myself and my team i hope that you enjoy your extended long weekend because i know already your laptops were closed many hours ago if you're on the road heading off to whatever destination that you're going to be spending your long weekend please get there safely we will see you on monday we'll be right here one till three o'clock on the full circle with myself bridget Massinger. the conversation continues 
continues on all of our social media platforms uh, at SAFM Radio. And of course, you can also find me on at Bridget Masinga. Inshallah, God willing, we get to do it again. SAFM 104 to 107 nationwide.